a good way to take uh, secure notes or mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> or or have a private calendar that's not in the cloud. There's a good use for it. I have one of those on my wall, Joe. Hey everyone, welcome back to Linux Weekly. Daily Wednesdays where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of Linux and open source. I'm Vince Stone, joined every week by Jill Bryant and everybody watching Hello. us live on Twitch. How's it going? We're here, hey. middle of the week. Plenty of time to get into some trouble mm -hmm. and maybe apologize for the trouble that we've gotten in because there's been a couple <laughs> of days since we've last reconvened. Yeah. Yeah, so you know last week I was talking about the Jitsi server because that was our like pilot thing with uh, running Jitsi on a Raspberry Pi. We're back again this week. I was hoping to have some interesting data points to give everybody. But if you tuned in on Saturday, we just had an old school classic Linux mm -hmm. Eamcast train wreck. Um, <laughs> yes. That episode was sponsored by Charter Business Internet. Um, by the time we got done with that show, I had less than a megabit of upload speed. And we were oh. still doing a live stream, kids, because <laughs> we've been doing this for a long time. And uh, we were, it was audio only by that point. Everybody was in a Discord call, but we got it done. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get the data points that I wanted to share with everyone and finish up the video. But this upcoming Saturday, but I have been playing a lot with the Jitsi server. Doing some configurations with the uh, turn and stun set up to kind of punch through some NAT connections just for like general availability, because I want to have a comprehensive guide. I've absolutely bitten off more than I can chew on this. Have you ever had this happen? You just know how to do something, right? You've been working on something long enough, or you just have enough uh, background knowledge, background skills. So when you're like, oh, okay, this project, da, 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 and you get it done, you're like, that wasn't too bad. But you go back to write the steps down, you're like, oh my. Oh, oh my. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is really involved. There's a lot of stuff here that you, because it clicks, like if you're coming at this from an outside perspective. Yes. That, yes. You know, that inherent <laughs> knowledge that you just have. And when you start putting pen to paper, like, oh man, um, I yeah. don't think just, you know, somebody's not going to pick this up and do it. And trying to come up with a, it's going to be very challenging to write from somebody's like, hey, I'm going to buy a Raspberry Pi and set up a Chitsy server. Like, yeah. Yeah, because you gotta you you gotta write down all those things that you just know automatically, but the audience doesn't. So <laughs> things that you don't time. even think about, like um, yeah. <laughs> what is an IP address? What's the difference between my public IP address, my um, router's IP address, the Jitsi <laughs> Raspberry Pi's IP address, port forwarding, and static IP addresses, and like there's yes. all this stuff that's uh. <laughs> We'll see. I, again, I don't think I've bitten off more than I can chew, but it's taken me a couple of shots because I've done a couple of passes. The way I work stuff, I write out a script, then I'll do like a test run of something and it'll just completely fall apart. And we've done that twice so far this week. Jill, you uh, you got excited. I posted a little I video did. yesterday and I'm like, hey, this is kind of cool. Jill's like, oh. Yeah. So uh, Ven posted actually in our Discord chat yesterday. Devol Devolver Digital released the trailer for the upcoming release of the Talos Principle 2 game on November 2nd. <laughs> so it, this is, uh, it was very exciting. So when uh, Ven posted it, I immediately went to the Steam webpage and it was available for pre-order. So I went ahead and pre-ordered it for me and my dear friend uh, Sharon from the Linux Chicks. So... <laughs> <laughs> the first time then I pre-ordered a game, <laughs> but they give did give me a deep discount because I, I had already purchased the first one, and I'd even done beta testing on on the initial release before it officially came out. Oh yeah, I remember so doing that. Linux. That was kind of yeah. fun way back. Yeah, in the you day. remember that? That was I can't believe this. The Tales Principle, the original, actually released in December 2014. I couldn't believe it was that oh, yeah. long ago. <laughs> So, how about, let's talk about uh, something that I've always considered to be a little bit of a puzzle. That's small form factor and micro PCs. Yeah. Yeah, this is something that you could probably uh, play the Tales Principle 2 on. So, the German Linux hardware manufacturer Tuxedo Computers has released a new mini Linux computer out. And it's called the Tuxedo Nano Pro Gen 12. 
And don't be fooled by the name Gen 12 in the name. You know, initially when I saw it, I thought, you mean, does it have a 12th Gen Intel Tel Core processor in it, like a Core i5 or Core i7? No, not that kind of Gen 12. <laughs> it's, just, it's just the name of the model, the Gen 12. But it actually comes with the competitor to Intel. It comes with either a Ryzen 5 7535U with six processor cores and 12 threads, or the Ryzen 7 7735U with eight cores and 16 threads. So that's an AMD machine all the way. <laughs> and uh, along with, of course, it comes with onboard Radeon graphics and up to 64 gigabytes of DDR5 memory, up to four terabytes of MVME, supports up to four monitors, and it has your choice of Ubuntu-based Tuxedo OS or Ubuntu, Kubuntu, or Ubuntu Budgie 22.04 LTS release. And if you need it, Windows 11, Home, or Pro, <laughs> boo-hoo, <laughs> boring. <laughs> so, but you may need that. But I think it's really cool, then, that they have an option of Windows 11 as a virtual machine, which is really nice. They'll pre-install that for you. That's awesome. And I went ahead and configured a Tuxedo Nano Pro Gen 12 with full specs, which came out to almost two grand or 2,000 euros. But the base is 149 euros. 149 euros? 140, 149. <laughs> oh my gosh, I read my writing wrong. <laughs> no, 849 euros. Uh, or over 900 US dollars. <laughs> and, but, you know, if you need a high quality mini computer for digital signage as a media PC or as a work PC, this little box would have you covered with all their support and their, their custom uh, Linux OS. So it's, it's a pretty sweet little computer. Well, <laughs> Tuxedo, I've picked on Tuxedo in the press because they, they've always had like a little bit of a premium on the stuff that they rebudge. You know, let's be clear, yeah. they, they, they didn't make this. And, took it, and what, what, what are they doing? They're going to be offering you the support for it. It's going to come pre-installed with Linux, and it's going to say Tuxedo on it somewhere. Where does this one say Tuxedo on it? There it is. See? It says Tuxedo. Yeah. <laughs> so eight, what did you say, Jill? 849 euros, huh? Yes, correct. Because... Lo and behold, if uh, that looks familiar, does that? Yes, it does. <laughs> In fact, well, no, it's clearly different. Jill, it doesn't say tuxedo on it. Hmm. Oh, hmm. okay. Has to be a complete. No, this is a. This is the rebadge. This is the original unit. Um, Azrock. This is their industrial systems, yeah. and you know, same thing. Seventy-seven thirty-five U. The bare bones Azrock system. This guy right here is going to set you back. 500 bucks yeah that's big enough. difference <laughs> stick with me here i'm not throwing tuxedo under the bus i want you yeah. to stick with me because it's the same system from tuxedo plus an eight gig stick of memory ram it's going to set you back 994 euros plus if you're in the states in north america an additional 99 euros for shipping but it does come with a two-year warranty but so does the azrock um if you're in North America, that's what I'm going to say. This is not a value at all. Yeah. So you if you're in the U.S., that. but tuxedos, like, of yeah. course not. We don't, like, you know, that's like System <laughs> 76 talking to people, like, in Europe going, yeah, it's really expensive to get a System 76 system in Europe, too. So that's where companies like um, Tuxedo come into play. Mm -hmm. So if you are looking for that support and you got somebody locally to deal with, you know, because if you buy one of these directly from Azrock or a reseller. Like, what do, you, what do you do when it breaks? Like, you, sh you ship it back and hopefully they RMA something eventually, whatever. But, you know, you get something from Tuxedo, you got a place to send it back to. You got a place to call up and go, hey, we got a problem yeah. with this. And you're going to get a hold of somebody who's going to be able to help you out with it. So that's like that. What I say about System 76 when people complain about the prices, you're paying for the support. Yeah. And, and you get the Linux support on top of it. So. Well, that's what I'm talking about when I say support. Yeah. So. That's what you're going to be getting. Uh, but if you're like me, if I wanted something like that, I've always been attracted to the micro PCs. Also, thank you, Arthur, for throwing this into our show notes. Um, 
mm-hmm. they've always been too expensive. I'd never, like this, the Nooks, because, you know, I, the Nooks came well before these. And, you know, he, the entire time they've made Nooks, I'm like, where's the AMD option? They have the AMD option. I'm like, it's just as much. I'm like, not like this. So, um, <laughs> but if you want something small, tiny, a thermal little high-powered nope box, go get it. Um, yeah. From a really well-known Linux hardware manufacturer that a lot of people like. I don't need a five to $800 <laughs> <laughs> computer, Jill, that I could lose. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> what do we got up next? All right, so I got to tell you guys about some audio stuff. Presonus. Been around for a while. You might know them. They make audio interfaces. If you um, watch the series that I do, interfacing Linux, I've not just done one, but do a Firewire pre, uh, PreSonus audio interface. And more recently, um, Kai Jorai, Kai Linux, bought mm-hmm. um, the Studio One, not Studio, what was it called? Who remembers what it was called? Can you beat me? I'm, I'm forgetting the model number. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, the IO station 24C. IO station. Okay. <laughs> PreSonus IO station. So they make a bunch of hardware, but they've also had their own software stack digital audio workstation called Studio One. It's been around for a long time. It has something like since 2009. And the latest version is out 6.5. And there's a public beta. Why are we interested in this? Well, it does a bunch of cool stuff, you know. This one updated plugins and look at it it looks like skittles and rgb horror i love it uh Do- dobly atmos is uh built into this yeah binaural headphone stuff all the plugins have been updated mm-hmm. uh, you know just cool oh and they have their own um open source uh DAW project file format thing which is always thought that was kind of cool and uh tablature just everything that you would expect to see in a reasonably modern DAW. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. Whatever. Not really terribly interested. Oh my God, they released the Linux version. Uh, They did. Yay. Everybody. This is, if you follow audio under Linux, media production under Linux, jaw hit the floor type moment. Mm -hmm. Because 6.5 is a public beta for Linux. Uh, Weird. Now, basically, this one right now is AMD only at the moment. It is AMD or Intel integrated. I don't know about uh, Intel Arc right now because I haven't got one yet. Uh, it does require a system that is configured for Jack. They even have a section because uh, this is like one of the like downsides. I'll tell you about this in a minute. Um, it's a Debian package. You got to use Ubuntu 2304. Uh, you know, I reversed what packages you need on Debian 12, but then again, I can't get it to run because. You also need Wayland. This thing is hard coded mm-hmm. for Wayland, which is kind of interesting. And it has to be a Vulcan 1.1 compatible graphics card. Also, very old move cotton type thing. And uh, this really narrows things down because when we talk about digital audio workstations under Linux, the only things we're really missing, like commercial Linux DAWs, is Ableton and Pro Tools and this. You know, this is something I always mm-hmm. see come up in conversation, like, why well, need Studio One to work under Linux? And yeah, you could get it to work with Wine. This is kind of interesting because they're up to something over at PreSonus, and that's always a good thing. And it could be really big for Linux, the knock-on effects for this, because PreSonus makes a lot of hardware, like big commercial hardware, arena-type hardware, integrated solutions, and they really like tying that hardware into their software, into the DAW. That's one thing Studio One's always been good, that super tight compatibility. It's like Avid and Pro Tools, like where everything's just tied together. You know, all the buttons are mapped and you don't have to worry about it. So doing that to tie Studio One into their hardware under Linux is going to require Linux drivers for their hardware, official Linux drivers that they're going to support but they haven't announced this is just me connecting the red yarn on the back of my wall here. <laughs> and that would be, that could possibly make PreSonus like the first vendor with official Linux support for audio interfaces under Linux. Now, one of the things I want to point out is if we look at what doesn't work right now, because we're very clear about this. Certain features do not work under Linux. One of them. Okay. They say 
the wording I like here. Certain features are currently unavailable on Linux. Thunderbolt support for PreSonus hardware. Thunder noodles. Mm. None of those devices work under Linux. It doesn't matter if it's PreSonus, if it's Motu, whoever. Because you need drivers. Because, you know, it's Thunderbolt, you basically turn it into a PCI Express card. You know, like my RME AIO Pro, which requires kernel-level drivers. You can't, you know, there's no, um, you know, just generic mode for that. So when they say currently unavailable, maybe that's something that they're working on that makes me very excited about that. Um, things that don't work uh, that might throw you off, though. No third-party plugin GUIs. So if you use uh, audio plugins, you're accustomed to GUIs, you know. You open up your EQ, you get EQ curves or whatever you're going to be doing, EQ or compressors, whatever. All of your plugins, I don't know what the interface is going to look like, because uh, I know in Reaper, if I don't want to use the GUI, I can hit the UI button and it'll just give me the number digits with some, just some very generic sliders on it. Maybe that's how Studio, I've never used Studio One. Maybe that's how they're going to handle it. I'll know more tomorrow. Tomorrow's project is to get this installed, because again, it requires Wayland. <laughs> and it doesn't work with NVIDIA. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> so what I'm going to do tomorrow is on Jill's box over here. Uh, it has a spare uh, NVMe hole in it, and I got a spare NVMe drive. So I'm going to put that particular version of Ubuntu on there. Oh, and it does require Jack. They point that out. They didn't get a super fine point on it. They didn't say Jack pipe wire compatibility. They said Jack. Yeah, so, pure Jack. Um, one thing I know how to configure is Jack. I'll give this thing the best chance. Get it set up, get some footage. We're going to find out what it can and cannot do. And I want to get this out as quick as possible. I was talking to Jill about this in the pre-show. Go back if you want the full story, if you're a patron, and listen to that later on. Is I want to get ahead of any of the tech tubers that don't even know what a Linux is and try to install Linux on the weekend. And they're like, I can't even get it. You know, Linus Tech Tips. Imagine Linus yes. trying to install a hot dog <laughs> that he's trying to save something he's trying to save the deb file as an html or whatever and um he's double clicking yeah. it show people how to get it set up and then we'll find out what it can and cannot do i'm going to try to rush that out maybe get it out friday for everyone just to have that accurate information out there before the eventual person who's never used linux before showing off linux and it's going to be somebody you know with like half a million a million followers and i don't I want that counterpoint out there before that one gets yeah. done. Uh, another thing, it doesn't use, uh, can, it's not compatible with LV2 plugins, which is kind of big. Uh, yet, again, they say currently unavailable, so not having that GUI, because I have a bunch of other plugins. Uh, like All the native plugins, I assume, are going to work. I'm just guessing at this point. But, um, you know, I have a mixture of open source and commercial plugins on Linux that I need to work, but most of those are VST2 and VST3, so it's not going to be too big of a deal. Melodyne integration, a couple other things, and they say that their PreSonus hardware integration, preamp control, and stuff, all those things don't currently work yet. So, optimistic, a little bit excited about this. I don't know, like the conspiracy thing. I was talking to Jill about this earlier. Maybe they're working on a system. Like yeah. they're going to be rolling out. Like here's an appliance type thing that you can get, and it runs Linux, and you can do all this. Okay. Or then again, maybe they were working on an appliance type system. Uh, you know, a large room. You know, we're talking about something like hundred plus faders, and to do live shows, and they decided not to go through with it, but they did all the work getting everything moved uh, to Linux. Because you know, if you're going to be doing a uh, Appliance, you're going to use Linux because you want that extra money for that Windows license, right? Yeah. And Wayland's an interesting choice. It's, I fear it's going to be kind of limited. But, you know, if you just ask me point blank, is it premature to lock something to Wayland? Yes. However, somebody's got to do it. Yeah, definitely. Oh, you know, um, is, this will be the first DAW that works on Wayland on Linux. What's well, going to be the first DAW that is going to be written? For Wayland, because all all dolls work on Wayland, because you can use backwards compatibility. Oh, okay. Yeah, X, X Wayland. Wayland. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't even read that. I just glossed over it because I downloaded it, started to install it, and I was working back on what uh, the Debian file needed for dependencies and translating that to actual Debian from an Ubuntu speak. 
I'm like, why isn't this launch? I'm like, oh no, why is it? Oh, it's looking for Wayland. Oh no. So that's <laughs> going to be a fun project for the weekend. Excited about it. Exciting times. It Knock is. on effect though. We get somebody like Presonus. Presonus is a big player in the game to actually have official Linux support for their hardware, even if you don't care about the DOM. That's going to be a data point to point to, to whatever audio manufacturer, be it uh, Focusrite, Motu, whoever, and go, well, they have Linux support. Mm -hmm. Why don't you? Yeah. Name yeah, and shame, that's, right? All it takes is it's the first step. <laughs> the first company that does it, then the rest follow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. It's so cool. You know, I think it's awesome to, you know, not only see another DAW on Linux, but one of the big players. I was really surprised <laughs> when, when uh, Ven puts the, this in the show notes because I'm like, oh my gosh, Persona Studio One. You know, I've known a lot of people who use that. <laughs> so, so that's really cool. And I think it's neat that they're looking towards the fu future with Wayland support. You know, there's some Linux users there who understand how the industry in Linux is changing, moving from X to Wayland. So that's there is, definitely... I got to weigh yeah. a lot of that, though, with um, Studio One. How do I put this? I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but this is the truth. Uh, if you're doing a, like a production application, see, this is where I have questions. If anybody from PreSonus, so like if you're just one person that like, scored a major victory at PreSonus and you finally got them to let you roll out mm. your Linux things. I'd love to talk to you. Call me up. I'm easy to get hold yeah. to. I've got a million questions for you and we can make a little video out of it. Um, and I'll, it'll be a positive spin. But I, that's like one of the questions because would I run a production system on Wayland? Would I run a production system on Pipewire? The answer to that is no. <laughs> No, when I run yeah, a desktop not thing, right if, now. <laughs> some of us playing around, you know, just like working on, when I say production, would I use it live in production and count on it? Yeah. Like, I know this, nothing's going to go wrong here. Uh -uh. But for like desktop stuff, yeah. I wouldn't have a problem with it. But again, this is like super early days. Uh, and again, I really think it's fascinating that they're making that hard count. It's like, oh, this has got to be Wayland. Because welcome to the bold, bold, brave new world, kids. You're going to see more and more of this. Yeah. Now, being Wayland only completely, just even with KDE, if you got an NVIDIA card, you know, if you're the 83% of discrete GPU owner market, I mean, we're not counting laptops here. Um, you're just SOL. So, mm. but, you know, even being a team green loving, I have a NVIDIA card and I have like, <laughs> I have a Threadripper and 25600Gs on my left and right. It's okay. You probably got an AMD system or a newer yeah. <laughs> Intel system laying around. I'm going to try it on one of these 5600Gs tomorrow. And uh, oh, we're going to report back. Uh, good on you, Presonus. Cool. Uh, stick with it. Interesting. <laughs> All right, you insufferable hipster. Tell me about your ASCII. Yeah. <laughs> so this is really cool. There's uh, something fun you can do with the AA library, <laughs> ASCII art library. There is a new easy to use flat pack application that I've been using that lets you convert pictures into ASCII art. And those exist, of course, on the terminal. And there's some other apps that do this. But this is by far the quickest and easiest <laughs> one uh, to do that with. And it is actually called, this app is called Letterpress. And you can save your ASCII art to a TXT file, copy it, and even adjust the resolution with the handy width and characters toggle, or with the point size plus or minus toggle located in the main menu. And it's just so easy. I imported a, a picture of the classic text penguin to demonstrate it. And I, I made a high resolution um, ASCII art, which Finn is showing right now, of Tux the penguin. And it looks really, it's really well done. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's kind of nice that, you, you know, usually I go in the terminal to do this and then you have to, you know, futz around with your, your, your different uh, width and characters and whatnot in the terminal. But it, it's nice to just have a quick and easy GUI to do this with. And it's a flat pack. You can go over to Flathub and, and get it right now. I just downloaded it from the Pop! OS shop. And, and because Pop! OS shop 
supports flat packs right there. It was very easy. And what's really cool about this, this is actually the same developer of the app called Calligraphy that lets you convert text to ASCII art. We actually talked about here on LWW number 378 last June. So, and that was brilliant. But the one of the awesome things about this is this is a developer whose name is Gregorny on GitLab is a young teenage developer from Germany. And uh, way to go. I'm very impressed <laughs> by, by these apps. They're awesome. <laughs> I wanted to give him a shout out for sure. Let's talk about the latest and greatest things. Uh, I was trying to figure out whether or not I had a Palm Pilot back in the day. And yeah. I don't think I did. I think I had the option to get one for work at one point, and I laughed heartily. Okay. And just kept on with it because I, I don't even like carrying around a mobile phone. Like I am not that person. And like back in the day, I just keep everything up here. And I still try to do that these days. I just forget stuff. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a Palm had a, it stayed around for a while. I didn't even, you know, we had the PDAs. The PDA started with Palm OS. You could write stuff in that lead speak thing. On, it would sometimes work with handwriting detection. And, uh, you know, later on they became uh, like, a lot of them were like Windows CE devices, right? Yeah, absolutely. Wince. Wince. <laughs> but um, pocket PCs are a curiosity. You know, a lot of people have uh, made videos about them on YouTube. reason we want to talk about them is somebody's managed to get Palm OS up and running on a Raspberry 2040. Mm -hmm, so cool. And a Raspberry 2040 is barely a computer. I mean, <laughs> it's a glorified, like, uh, Arduino, if you really <laughs> think about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, Dimitri is the gentleman's name. He wanted to test Repalm, which is a Palm OS, uh, on actual hardware. You know, it's like, it turns out that it ran an em em uh, emulator well enough. They're like, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and make a custom kernel and get this thing up and running on the Cortex-M processor instead of this 2040. And here we are. Like, Yay. that looks, uh, yeah, I, honestly, I, I completely forgot that there were color versions of Palma ones. That's more what I'm thinking about. Oh, uh, yeah. We got a nice little video here of uh, this thing starting up. For audio listeners, this is just, you know, the LCD with some wires hanging out of it, not TSA approved at all. <laughs> and you had to have the stylus to interact with the screen. Look at that. Handwriting. Yeah, nice. Go home. Oh, wow. I don't miss these dark times at all yeah Aww. let it be gone burn it <laughs> i liked palm <laughs> especially later when they made web os because a lot of the technology was put into web os so for me this this is uh you know part of my nerd rage <laughs> i love this kind of stuff and i have i was telling van i have i think yeah four four different uh palm devices Palm OS devices like the Pocket. I have a Palm Pocket, an HP version, and a couple others. I didn't initially when they came out. My my brother had used them at work, and I got a couple of his hand me downs later on. <laughs> but I always, I always, you know, it was it, it was ahead of its time, you know, with the the being able to write on it and uh, converting and translating the. Text. We were easily amused by it. Yeah, you had to like plug yeah. it in to a serial port <laughs> on the back of your computer to sync that, it. That was yeah a trick. Some people had issues trying to Not do USB. that. Why? Because USB <laughs> didn't exist. Yeah, <laughs> and it does work on Linux when you do that on Linux. <laughs> There's drivers for it. <laughs> the, um, no internet access. Uh, and, like they, they were personal digital assistants, and um, yeah, I mean it, it's fascinating that somebody was able to. Get this up and running. I'm sure there will be uh, and stuff. I, oh, dude, I, I'm <laughs> sure. Maybe you know somebody that carries a realm of palm today. They're like, yeah, man. <laughs> so, you know what? It'd be very secure data organization, though, right? You don't have to worry yeah. about anybody snooping on your stuff. Yeah, exactly. A good play. A good way to take uh, secure notes, or mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> or or have a private calendar that's not in the cloud. There's a good use for it. I have one of those on my wall, Joe. Yeah, yes. <laughs> a physical calendar. I do too in my kitchen. <laughs> it's like six years out of date, but yeah. hey. But 
this is awesome. It's a Raspberry Pi Pico for the win. And I think it's really cool that this just worked on the Raspberry Pi Pico. With, it's something with to do some with the 2040, but, you know? I mean, yeah. this, I, I respect this because sometimes I'll walk into a little uh, tech storage room and like, what do I want to do with some of this? And, you know, this is along the same lines of like looking at a thing. I'm like, I need to come up with a good use for you. I'm like, you know what? Let's just get Palm OS <laughs> up and running on this thing. That, that's fantastic. Yeah. It's good to see. Not necessarily practical, but hey, you know, if you, if you wanted that blast from the past and you want like actual hardware, I'm sure somebody will cobble it together. Yes. All right, Jill. <laughs> we're running a little bit long. So yes. we're going to run out of here, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Yeah. So much fun. And we're just going to take a minute to thank all of our beautiful party patrons, people making yeah. the show possible. Patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast. Here they come. Here they come. On the credits yeah. button. Zabber Fang, once again, thank you for your pledge of $2.50. And, uh, and thank you to Anthony MO690 for the follow. <laughs> thank you to our advisors, like our Theron, who contributes to the show by giving us new stories. We love you. And to our Chicago Kicks people, our sea monsters. And by the way, these are all the different levels that are on Patreon that you can donate to the to Linux Gamecast and LWW on. And all our wonderful chairlings. Oh my gosh, LWW 394. I can't believe it. <laughs> I can because I'm good at counting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right, beautiful people. We'll see you next week. Bye, all. Love you all. Yeah.